Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company and thank you so much for tuning in to one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And today is no exception. We're so thrilled to be joined by the wonderful Reinhold Heil, who is the composer for the current AMC series, Deutschland 89, following on from Deutschland 83 and 86. And I actually wanted to jump in by asking you about the genesis of your involvement, because you mentioned how um, you know, you had a little bit of anticipation jumping into the television series when it first came your way, but once you saw the very first scene, that was what really grabbed you. And I was really interested in kind of hearing a little bit about what it was so specifically about those first few frames that made you say yes to the job and made you feel like this was going to be a really great creative project for you to be involved in. Yeah, I didn't know about the creativity, but I knew that <clears throat> that it was it was right for me because I actually lived through that scene. So uh, when I saw it, it it's, it's the beginning of, of the first episode of Deutschland 83, where uh, two West German students who had illegally changed uh, uh, Western currency to Eastern currency at a rate of one to four, which is the actual real exchange rate. But that was, of course, illegal to do because they forced you to change one to one. And it was one of their sources of income for the GDR. So then people, people did that a lot. They went over there, they found people on, on the main square and uh, exchanged money and uh, uh, then went and, and could basically knock themselves out with purchasing stuff that, you know, books, especially books. And I, I bought music, I bought printed music, bought some Bach and some Stravinsky uh, scores and stuff like that. And in, in the series, the two guys uh, are theater majors and they uh, buy a whole bunch of Shakespeare and Karl Marx. And, uh, but the, the way the scene goes down is exactly the way it went down in my life. And this was already in the late seventies, I think when that mm -hmm. happened to me. Uh, so that basically the Stasi is onto you because the Stasi is probably involved in even in the illegal exchange. And the whole thing is basically a scam because when you come back to the border, they have been following you or they photographed you or whatever, and they will identify you and they know you have the purchase somewhere in your car and then they will bust you and take the, take the stuff away from you. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. And so I said, well, it looks like somebody did their homework in terms of the historic background and how the conditions were actually were. And this is not some dumb, uh, you know, dramatization of some, you know, it, there's something, there's something solid to the research. And that, of course, I found was, it, it became even better and better over all these years. And I think Jörg Winger, who was a little bit younger than I, but actually also lived through the time and not necessarily in West Berlin, but was, for instance, member of the German, West German military. So you, you, that, that influenced like the the course of the first season because mm -hmm. you know it plays partially in a uh, in in the barracks and in within the the NATO military uh, scene and all that stuff, but he is his research is just outstanding. You know? mm -hmm. So the, the the historic backdrop for this very fictitious story is extremely solidly researched, and that's mm -hmm. that makes it not just entertaining but also very educational. I love that about the show. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned how, you know, the research that he brought to the table was a really valuable asset for you as well in your role as a composer. And I was really fascinated by that because I think people don't often think about the way that research plays in beyond filmmaking and acting to the other facets of, of pulling a show like this together. And so I was really interested in kind of like how that helped you to find the sound and the voice of, of the show. And if that's something that going into this series of it, if that's something that he still brings to the table and you still find to be a useful tool. Yeah, I mean, he's he's just a really, uh, it, and so is Anna, but Anna was uh, sort of withdraw a, a little bit over time. She's a co-creator, so they're, they're, I've, I'm pretty sure that their creative process is very much sort of a bouncing to and fro, um, which I have no insight into because, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes see them and it's more like a social event than, than, than creative. Uh, so the creative thing has basically been reduced to, uh, to me just, having a, a, a conversation, then doing a pass and then waiting patiently or impatiently for, you know, cause he's super uh, uh, slammed with so many things simultaneously. And that of course got slowed down with COVID now in the, in the, in the post-production. Um, but then when the notes come, uh, they always elevate uh, the, 
the outcome. So, I mean, he's, he's basically my first customer, so to speak, and that's how he um, responds. And it's very generous and it's very, it's not complicated at all. Even if I have to go back to the drawing board a few more times, mm -hmm. it seems like it's really smooth. He's very accepting. And when I try to experiment, he lets me. So it's, it couldn't be a more lovely, uh, you know, project to work on where you hardly want to call it work because you, it, you know, you, there's even a way of, um, of putting your desires for trying something new, uh, you know, it, there's always room for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was also really interested in kind of specifically going into this season and, you know, because they are these standalone series as well, kind of how you uniquely approach the sound of it, because there's moments within it that feel very reminiscent of the previous ones, but obviously it still kind of has its own identity. So what did that journey look like for you in terms of mapping out where you wanted to pull inspiration from the previous ones, mm -hmm. um, but really kind of also at the same time create this really unique entity. Yeah, there, is, there, there are themes that are, of course, allocated. Originally, I allocated them to more to people or to, to individual characters. And then they kind of expanded because of course, I didn't quite know where everything was going to go. So uh, uh, these themes do, recur and I try to always work everything to picture. I mean, sometimes it really is because, because they also temp the new episodes with the music from the pre previous seasons. Uh, and that of course doesn't always make sense, but sometimes it's just so perfect that you go like, okay, there's not much we need to do. We can just open up the old file and, you know, tailor it to, uh, to this particular scene. And this actually I have a, an assistant co-arranger who's also the music editor on the show, Paul Parker. And, uh, you know, I leave all of that stuff to him and he kind of, you know, he, he then takes care of a bunch of cues in an episode and lets me focus on developing new material. And he does this really well to actually, you know, he, he knows everything. He's been also through mm -hmm. the entire series. So uh, he's also my memory. I'm mean, like, wasn't there something? And then he just, yeah, yeah, I know where that was and he digs it out and I don't have to worry about it. So I'd be pretty screwed without him. Um, but, you know, artistically speaking, the, the, the overall atmosphere at the beginning was this kind of brooding, you know, dark, there's always this dark cloud hanging over everything. And that dark cloud is basically a, you know, radiation <laughs> potential, you know, all out uh, nuclear warfare. Um, and, and in the second season, we have this, this travel that starts in the South of Africa, goes to Angola, goes to Libya, and then back to Berlin, and has a lot to do with the, the terrorism. Um, mm. So even the, the main theme just undergoes this sort of geographical journey. There's, you know, African drums. I, I did all this myself. I mean, I have a whole bunch of percussion, and I didn't even hire any musicians. It's this typical... Um, typical thing where uh, an electronic musician composer just does the whole thing. And I let Paul play the guitars because that's what he does really well. And um, so, so the themes remain consistent and there's something that Jörg considers the Deutschland theme. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that, that opens up uh, not the very first scene, not the very first moment, but uh, it's the first piece of score in the first episode of the third episode. And it's basically the same piece of music that is at the very beginning of the first episode of season one, but it is very, very different in terms of its energy and its orchestration. Mm -hmm. So when the other thing was really reduced and very sort of, not mellow, but uh, dark and, and held back, Mm -hmm. uh, this one is like in your face exploding and it has a string quartet uh, on, on top of it. So uh, that I really wanted to do. I just really wanted to get some players and not really do absolutely everything. And uh, since we, we are very limited in our budget, there was no, and also I didn't think that was, that would have been a good idea to go into the orchestral realm mm -hmm. and just make it big uh, uh, in that way. I also think that a string quartet when, when played really 
vividly, it, it's actually even more aggressive than a whole big orchestra. You know, it's more scrapey sounding. And, uh, and that's what I wanted. I wanted it to be very in your face. And now everything has come to this surprising and unexpected and super dramatic moment where the wall actually falls. Mm -hmm. And that's of course only the beginning of, uh, of this season. So, I mean, I, I was actually going, how is he going to do this? do the story where at the end there's this one thing that everybody knows already and of course he's not doing it like that they, they start out they start out with the wall coming down and now the drama un unfolds for all these characters that we know where they have to reinvent themselves and you know where do they turn what do they what they make what do they make of the situation who's trying to profit like war profiteers you know that's that, I, and it's interesting because I lived in Berlin. I had some money, I had some real estate at the time when the wall came down and somehow I was reluctant to benefit from it. And it was funny that even some people who were considered or considered themselves progressive, more left-wing, mm -hmm. ended up you know, buying real estate in East Berlin, eventually mm -hmm. kicking the people out who were living in these uh, buildings, nicely renovating it for themselves and stuff like that. So um very very interesting uh and also something that a uh, period that i that i lived through in, yeah. in Berlin. yeah i think it's so interesting the way that you kind of you talk about the sound of, of the, the series and these episodes in particular being very dramatic and very in your face because one of the other things i actually love about the way that you've crafted it is there's also equally moments where you really pull back and you allow moments of silence or just kind of like singular notes to really be what builds the tension. And so it's really kind of fascinated by that and how you kind of determine where you really want to go full in and pull in all of the instruments and where you just really want to pull back and just have those like little quiet moments to build the tension in a completely different way. Yeah, I, that, that was part of that experimental thing is like the, you know, if we don't want to give too much away, but there's this uh, assassination and it's also a really, it's everybody is stunned. And I was going like, how do I get this feeling across of, of you know, it's, it's where time stands still. You have this adrenaline, adrenaline shock and, you know, you get this weird feeling on your ears. You know, there's some weird pressure there. It's, it physically manifests itself in everybody who just hears about what just happened, mm -hmm. uh, whether they whether they are attached to this person or not, but just the, the magnitude of, of such a, a, a crime, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, the grief that sets in. So yeah, that was something where, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm using an interesting uh, kind of synthesis there. It's, it's all in the, in the box. The computer is doing it all. It's called, it's like a modal synthesis, physical modeling. It models the behavior of a string, but mm -hmm. you don't imitate an instrument. You can then shape it and basically play it like an instrument with controllers mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, percussion emerges out of it, you know, this, that string starts to all of a sudden be ignited in some random kind of way and stuff like that. So that's like the basis of, of that cue. I think you're talking about that cue, where, mm -hmm. the, where the assassination happens, episode four. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then I, I put bells on top and very sparingly and despite the fact that the, the underlying uh, tension is sort of very sort of semi-electronic and very experimental, the chords that are on top are almost late romantic Wagnerian German, you know, they could be orchestral, but they're not. I'm not choosing to do orchestral. I just do these little bits of bells and uh, they do something emotionally just because of the chord progression. It doesn't matter what whether they use, uh, you know, big Wagnerian brass or whether they use these little bells, the chords convey the emotion. And of course, the, the more reduced it is for a situation like this, the better. So I, yeah, I thought I'm pretty proud of that cue. I think that came out really well. Yeah, it's beautifully done. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your collaborative relationship with the editing team, because I imagine that you know, so much of what they do feeds into what you do in terms of like the pacing, the cuts that they're making, the shots that they're choosing. So kind of how far along in their process do you wait 
before you start jumping in and composing? Or do you kind of start creating an initial framework where the, while they're still pulling together those specific details? And like, how do the two of you work hand in hand on pulling that together? Um, I've, of course, it's easier to wait for the lock cut. Mm -hmm. um, and the later you, it goes in the, in the season, the more likely it is that you actually, you fall behind a little bit and then you're gonna start out with the lock cut and that's kind of cool. So it's not so much that I give them too much feedback. They actually give, the, they lay down the groundwork. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and sure, if, if the, the cut is not locked, then I send them something. And I'm not even sure if they look at it so closely because they do actually set the pace. And sometimes the pace is set up with a, with a piece from the previous episode. And even if I disagree with their choice, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, I kind of like to do that because I go like, otherwise the whole thing is just gonna marinate in itself. You know, that's, I, I'm, I always like, they do it very rarely that they even use a, a, a totally different uh, piece of music for temp that I didn't write, that I don't even know. But I always welcome that because you're like, okay, that's like, a, uh, you know, a, a, a fresh dip in the gene pool a little bit, you know, otherwise I have to generate all that myself and I basically have to reject a temp. But what I can't reject from the temp, and this is interesting that you're bringing that up, is the pacing. Mm -hmm. Because the music, uh, you know, if they take a piece of music and they edit their, their scene around it, they help, they let the music help them with the pace. So they, 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 they even... You know, sometimes the atmosphere or the, the emotion of the music isn't even right for the scene. But if the tempo feels right for them, for what they are trying to create with the edit, then that's what it is. And then I ignore everything else, but I stick to the pacing. It's mm -hmm. rare that I completely upend everything. And if I upend everything, I even do it with the pocket calculator because then I find, because I really, really like when they, when they do musical editing. And they are all good on this show. They're, they're all very musical, these guys, um, <clears throat> and women. Uh, they, they, uh, I think, you know, that you you can take the the pocket calculator and say, okay, so what's what's the beats per minute of the temp piece if it's a consistent tempo? Even mostly it is in this style that we're using here. Um, <clears throat> and then I I have an idea that's great, but it's it it needs to be playing a lot slower. Mm -hmm. So I do two thirds of the beats per minute or three quarters of the beats per minute so that there's still a ratio and the, the, the way the, the edits fall is mm -hmm. in a way still maintained. Yeah, I also, you know, one of the things everybody always kind of like gleams onto with, with the sound that you created on this specific project is the fact that even though it is in itself a period piece, that's not the direction that you've taken the music in and it does have that kind of contemporary sound, but it still feels very much like it fits into the world. Um, and I know you've also mentioned that you've kind of strayed away from using very 80s sounds, except for when there's romantic moments and that's where you kind of sneak it in a little bit. So it's really interested in the juxtaposition between the idea of this period piece, but contemporary music and how you really worked to make that such a cohesive thing throughout the show. I don't know if that's such a conscious process you know if it's just where i'm at as they used to say as they say uh, in, in the states that's where i'm at uh because i'm i have that history behind me you know i used to produce pop music in the 80s and i don't think that completely you can completely shed that but it was sort of my first question when they offered me the job is that do you really want me to do the 80s thing because this is a spy show, it should have a score, and score is not 80s pop music. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, that's to totally not what we want. We definitely want a contemporary score. And then I was really happy to hear that, you know? And, I, and, and my first intention was, let's just not do any of this 80s stuff. And then it just came out, you know? Then we were like, oh, that's nice. It has a, <laughs> a tiny little bit of Phil Collins in it. Maybe that's a little bit too cheesy. You know, let's twist it. And the other, and not that I have anything against Phil Collins, but uh, you know what I'm saying. So, uh, yeah. So for whatever reason, the family theme and and those romantic themes ended up being a bit more from the time. And then the question is, of course, how does that play, and how does it reach the filmmakers? Because at the end of the day, I I serve the project and I serve these uh, creators of the of the project. <clears throat> And they were supposedly happy. So, 
Uh, and I guess that uh, maybe also the choice of songs, you know, because we, they were always choosing songs from these years, 83, 86 and 89, um, that was, that might maybe helps giving the, the great cohesive, you know, the overall sound. Um, but I also think it's just really uh, timbres that I use, you know, where it's the same timbre. I can use a synthesizer. It's an analog synthesizer. Jesus, you know, there's nothing super new about it. You know, Mo came up with it in the 1960s. <laughs> and back then we said, you can do any sound you want with that. No, you can't. It sounds like an analog synthesizer that is actually fairly limited in their expression. So, <clears throat> you know, you can use that for a contemporary piece of scoring and you you know, if you use it for an 80s kind of piece, it's almost the same sound, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so that's why I, I don't want to take uh, credit for putting it all together. It's just sort of, there's a, there's a palette of sounds there. That's what I do. I actually have it. I have a template and it's not a musical template. It's, it's a mixing template because I, I love, I'm an engineer too, by trade. I mean, a sound engineer. So, and producer, music producer. So I have a template that has my sound built in with the effects, the reverbs, all of this kind of stuff. And it has a whole bunch of sounds. So it's like a painter with a palette. And uh, I start out empty, I determine the pacing and I start putting things down. And that's, I never have a writer's block because I just do. And then when it's really crap, I throw it out and I start over. Uh, but I never sit there going, oh my God, mm -hmm. you know, where's the inspiration? The inspiration is right there in front of you. It's a great series that you're scoring. So it's like no, no problem with the, with the inspiration. But, you know, and, and for me, it's a, it's a holistic process. I don't, I don't hire any mixers. Um, as the piece emerges, the mix emerges along with it. You know, it's all one, one thing. Mm -hmm. And it gets more complicated when I start employing microphones and recording something live, because then you have to do a bit of post-production of that. And then you have to, you know, cut it into pieces and you use the pieces, maybe use, use them as samples. Maybe you uh, do something to them. You mangle them in a way so that they still have their organic origin, but they are contemporary sounding. And all of that is fun. My, it, it, I'm a really sad, sad person because my, my, my job is to compose music for, for movies and television. And my hobby is musical sound design. I hope, yeah, but again, you know, this is why I moved here because I'm sitting out and looking at the Pacific Ocean. I'm going, I can do musical sound design right here. Be yeah. outside. Because you're in Hawaii now, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> and I'm going to stay here too. I moved here just this week. <laughs> that sounds like an amazing place to be, especially right now with everything being the way it is. I wanted to pick up on, on the point that you made that I thought was really interesting about how, you know, you really see your role as a composer being in service of the creators and in service of the filmmakers that you're working with. Um, and kind of talk a little bit about language and, and the tools that they give you to be able to do that and to be able to step into their world and execute their vision. Because I imagine that for different filmmakers that saying, you know, even just a phrase like, oh, I really want it to pop right here could mean 20 different things. That's and right, so I was really right. fascinated by how you kind of navigate stepping into new projects and learning and understanding what that language and what that communication is from each filmmaker that you're working with. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's one of the reasons why filmmakers stick to their composers. Once they find somebody they get along with and where that language evolves, because it needs to be relearned with each filmmaker. As you were saying, you know, somebody says something to describe music, mm -hmm. it means one thing. Another person says, it uses the exact same words, it means a, the complete opposite sometimes. So, you know, it's like... Uh, I don't know who it actually was the person who coined the phrase, but there's this, you know, talking about music, it's like dancing about architecture. I think they're saying it was Brian Eno. If in yeah. doubt, it was Brian Eno, right? It was Frank Zappa. Zappa. Frank Zappa? Doesn't matter. It, it's a really, really true statement. And, and this is why when you, when you work with a new director, uh, it, it's always more, you have to, account for extra time 
because you will have misunderstandings. And uh, I think this is, this is one thing where I have the feeling um, where COVID has, has uh, enabled or you know, opened our eyes to the fact that we can actually do a lot of things on Zoom and remotely, which is one of the reasons why I decided I might as well be in Hawaii. Um, there's, the problem is for, at the beginning because for, it, there is nothing like sitting in a room with somebody having that vibe, whatever these sort of, you know, unscientifically speaking vibrations between people in the same room. Um, there's, it, that just needs to happen, I think. It needs to happen a few times and then you can go remote and then you want to refresh that every once in a while and it's all totally possible but a little bit of traveling needs to happen and that's why it was really good uh, york and anna came to los angeles i was still living in downtown los angeles at the time they spent a week there because they have family there so that was good they came to to my loft several times and then I sometimes flew to Berlin and uh, we, we kind of refreshed that sort of personal level. And I think that's, that is still very, very important. And now if you start projects and you start them on Zoom, yeah, Zoom is pretty good. You know, we get a bit of an idea of like what that other person is. We can somehow, there's definitely a connection. You have the visual thing, you see the facial expression, you hear the inflection of the voice, all of that stuff. That's all cool. But I really do think that there's something about being in the same room together. And uh, I think that's missing. I had a, a call, a Zoom call yesterday with my friends from Los Angeles, other composers. And uh, one of the composers was uh, just finishing up a series, of, a, a score for, for Netflix series, where she had that problem. Where they're all in Los Angeles, but they never see each other other than on Zoom. And she had incredible trouble uh, with like, you know, having to imitate the temp and this and that. And uh, we were trying to coach her through it over like several months and she actually survived it, but like barely. And I, I actually blame, partially blame the fact that, they, that she never had that personal connection. So I think that's something we have to rethink, you know, like do the remote work, but don't forget at the beginning to be, wow, I have like two green geckos here. One is on my laptop. Can't see it. Yeah, I can't. can't I just, just saw the, the keypad and the table. Camera. But maybe I can lure him over here. There's another one over there. <clears throat> have him on your shoulder by the end. Oh, there we go. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, I don't know. Did I did I not uh, just actually go off on a tangent again? No, you absolutely answered the question. And then oh, good, good, good. Also, beca because you've done television shows straddling, but you know, European shows and American shows, and you know, one of the main differences is in Europe, television is fully in the can. Every episode is made. Everything's complete before it goes on the air. But in the States, it tends to be that it starts airing while it's still being filmed a lot of the time. And especially for a TV show and creating the sound and having those moments where you're calling back into previous moments and pulling it forward into later episodes. But maybe that influences something that you want to go back and tweak in episode two when you're working on something later in the season. I was interested in kind of like how that forces you to work in two very different ways because of that. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of been unified a little bit by the streaming services because Netflix does it even more extreme in that the whole thing has to be done and gets released in one fell swoop, you know. So um, I think that American composers have had to learn that and maybe they come to appreciate it. But to be honest, uh, I don't jump back a whole lot. It seems a little bit impractical. But the fact that I, that I don't chase episode by episode gives me more breathing space to, mm -hmm. to do it right, you know? And then also to kind of, you, know, you, you always need to anticipate, but um, it's, not, it's definitely better to know where the story goes. And you can then ask, even if you haven't uh, seen the episodes yet, you can ask the filmmaker if, you know, where is this going? Um, and that informs, you know, certain things. Whereas with American series, I, you know, I, 
there's so much guessing and sometimes you guess wrong in a way, you know, and then you, you, you have aspects of the, of the score hitting a dead end in a way. It's mm -hmm. not that, it's not as horrible as it sounds, you know, it's it, small, small things where you're like, ah, this could have been better because of that but it's not all i mean i've never seen the horrible catastrophes but you go like also like what what are the writers doing you know sometimes the writers write themselves slowly into a corner and you go like oh i don't see the next season happening here you know so i think that's the worst problem you know mm -hmm. to get the story arc and i mean i'm sure they have to present the story arc before they get the series order or the season order um but you know, and, and, and I've seen situations where it wasn't just their ineptitude, but it was actually the limitations that were dictated by the budget. All of a sudden, they had to go to a certain location, and then they started writing, and they did their best. They were actually all really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. But those limitations all of a sudden put such a lid on it that, mm -hmm. you know, they were like, okay, this thing is coming to an end. And where everybody wants, hey, I want seven seasons. Right, and then it's just two. Yeah, yeah, and you were you were touching earlier on how you know a lot of times, and specifically specifically with this project as well, you tend to be actually executing the majority of the music yourself. It's not just sitting in a room and composing and passing it along to other musicians. You're actually really crafting that whole sound and that feel as well. And it feels like that's something that's becoming more and more prominent in the industry, particularly with budgets being more constricted in a lot of places. We don't see as much of you know, 30 piece orchestras on a film score as much as we used to. And so I was interested in the way that that A has like really served you as a composer in the industry throughout your time creatively, but also kind of for people who are stepping into that world, what kind of the most vital skills are that they can work on developing and, you know, accruing in order to be able to do that themselves. I know that you've mentioned that technology is a really vital thing for composers oh, yeah. to I mean, carry it in. Definitely the technology to have a good handle. It doesn't, you know, it seems to be, if you, if you go online and you look at the YouTube videos and, and Instagram, Instagram, which is just to basically get giant shopping mall, right? This, these days, uh, products are being, being shopped or around by, or like, uh, you know, advertised by influencers. The influencers give you 30 second chaotic pieces of impressive music, uh, impressively presented in a visual way and uh, <clears throat> none of this helps you with this kind of job um, and you don't need that other gadget and yet another gadget and it seems to be the tendency is like everything's now going to little boxes again you have to have a array of like a hundred different little gadgets and each one does this very specific thing like uh, you know and then oh there's this new thing and I need to have that now no, you need to have a, a really, really good handle. You have to develop a workflow with a piece of software that maybe you happen to learn first and you have put the most hours in. It doesn't matter what it's called. If you have put the hours with that software in and you have developed a, work, a workflow where you eliminate the, uh, the obstacles that, you know, for every little step, if you don't have that workflow, every little step is hard, hard work. You need to eliminate that and you can by doing, you know, shortcuts, little s scripts, key commands that you learn where you just hit a, a button with a letter on it and something happens and you don't have to think about it. Everything goes into muscle memory and that's when the flow comes in. Mm -hmm. And you, and it's all just about the creating. So once you have de uh, developed that workflow and not chase after, oh, here's this new thing and I will have to learn that other software. Yeah, you always have to learn software, especially plugins, you know, plugins come in, you have your, your DAW software, it's the digital audio workstation, which is like your, your actual studio. And then you can buy these additional things that do the most amazing things. And they work in, in Pro Tools and they work in Logic and they work in Cubase and they work in all the other DAWs. And so I, I don't advertise any of these things. Uh, you just find this one thing that kind of speaks to you and then you learn that as, as good as you possibly can. And <clears throat> you put those hurdles out of your way and, and you just think about the music anymore. 
And I think that's, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a long, long time, this like jamming with myself, which for sure needs to be shaken up every once in a while. So it's definitely good to, to exchange yourself with other people and you know, all of that stuff. Cause it gets, I think you get repetitive if you, if you, or you have to just, um, you know, artificially create, uh, you know, a different palette. Like that, that takes extra time, you know, that, that would be when you have a new project and you sit down and this is also stream of consciousness. If you have a sound library that's humongous and you just go through that sound library and you know what the project is about, and maybe you've le- read a little bit about it, you know what the subject matter is, you know what the overall atmosphere is, you've talked to the filmmaker and then you just don't even think about it, but you hear a sound, you try out a sound, and you go like, nah, you go. And all of a sudden there's one sound for, for whatever reason that you, you can't put your finger on it, you go like, that might fit in. And you just put that in the template and you continue going. And at the end of the day, then again, you have the limitation of just that template and you can always put new sounds in. Of course, it's, it, you don't have to, uh, make it a, a strict rule or anything, but that limitation creates a style. Style always comes out of limitation. You know, the style of a composer comes out of their limitation. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I think that's that's really really important for somebody to get in there um, is to to have this basic. Uh, uh, level of understanding of the technology so that it doesn't become an obstacle every step of the way Mm -hmm. and that's hard and it takes many years so i mean i started working with computers and music about 40 years ago so Mm -hmm. but you know the technology is so much better and so much easier and so much cheaper just on the upside for somebody who's now like say a 16 year old girl which i I, you know i want to see that I want to see female composers and female composers are in a minority because of what happens when they're 13, 14, 15, 16, because mm-hmm. they're not potentially not starting out playing the guitar or, and, and they're doing it more often now. This is all good, right? That's what I'm saying. But, but then also, you know, getting a computer, like having the parents go like, oh yeah, let, let's buy her a studio. A little mm-hmm. studio. It's not that expensive. It's not what it was 40 years ago. It was between tens of thousands of dollars. Now it's, oh, she already has that Mac. Well, let's buy her that software and a little audio in her face. Send her on her way, you know, because it's the, the you know, it, it, that kind of technology to, to grow into it and, and not, to, not to spend eight hours on TikTok, mm-hmm. but, you know, spend one hour on TikTok and six hours on Logic with a little laptop mm-hmm. there you go then then that technology thing is already out of the way and the creative uh the the actual you know the the, the process of, of of uh telling stories with music can come in you know because that's that's another craft altogether it's like what how do you tell the story how do you set the emotion how do you do it not too much in that you're not on the nose and you know, trying to push buttons, emotional buttons with, with the audience. Uh, <clears throat> the key word is, <sighs> I heard that in the con- context with Thomas Newman's music, who's a, a composer I admire very much, uh, emotional ambiguity. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to put a, an atmosphere there that is somehow evocative, but not in a specific way. It doesn't specifically say sad or happy mm-hmm. it's just there and then the, the the viewer actually adds something the the viewer sees what's happening the viewer is somewhere in in the story and the viewer is maybe more on the side of this character or that character and they infuse their own place where they are with that story and the music doesn't tell them no 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 you have to now be happy you know so uh that kind of stuff that comes just with doing it over and over and over again and exchanging, getting the feedback from, from the filmmakers who go like, no, no, I don't want you to tell me that, you know, over and over again. And then at some point you get it. 
I think that's such fantastic advice in so many different facets. And I hope that you're right with technology really you know, bringing those down those barriers and especially for female composers. And just want to thank you so much for taking time out of uh, your lovely relaxing day in Hawaii to talk to us so in depth about the show and your work as a composer. Thank you so much, Reinhold. Thank you for having me. It was a, it was a pleasure. <laughs>